Hey guys, Will here. So welcome back to the channel. It's been a while since we've done a review video here at Boosted Media, but we've been saving this up for our brand new studio. And we've got a very exciting product that we're gonna be checking out today. So this is the Grid by SimLab Porsche 911 RSR Sim Racing Wheel. As you can see in the middle, it has a beautiful, genuine Porsche emblem. This is a officially licensed Porsche product. Now it is a very expensive wheel, so there's a lot of things to go through today to help you decide whether this is something that you want to invest in. So let's just dive straight in and check this beautiful wheel out. So firstly, a big thank you to Grid by SimLab for sending this wheel across to us for review. Now we will be comparing the wheel to a bunch of other options in today's video as well. So it's important that you guys understand that the conditions in which we've done all of those reviews are exactly the same. All those products have been provided to us free of charge to check out. And in all cases, we do also have affiliate links available too. So if you guys wanna pick up any of the wheels that we talk about in today's video, if you use the links down in the description below, a small percentage comes back to us to help us keep on going here and running the channel. So we really do appreciate your support support there. But as is always the case here on the channel, this wheel and all the other wheels that we're going to be talking about today, absolutely no editorial control by the manufacturers or resellers or anything like that. Purely just our own opinions and uh, yeah, our own observations when it comes to all of these products. So it's important you guys are aware of all that stuff before we get started. But let's start off by talking about pricing. Now, as I mentioned earlier at the top of the video, it is an expensive wheel. Comes in at $2,247 US dollars, uh, $2,475 five euros or 3,200 and 58 Australian dollars. Now, obviously you do need to check your shipping and taxes uh, depending on where you are in the world as well. So check that out on their website. Again, link down in the description below. But it is a very, very expensive wheel. So we have the highest of expectations when it comes to things like build quality, functionality, and all of those things. Now, obviously being a replica of the Porsche 911 RSR wheel, it is quite a niche product as well. It's not gonna to appeal to everybody. And one of the things that I really hope we do see is a selection of other wheels that are similar build quality and functionality to this but maybe a little bit more generic so you don't feel silly driving around in your Lambo with a Porsche logo on your steering wheel. But as you'll see a little later on in today's video, the Porsche 911 RSR is an extremely fun car to drive in a variety of different sim titles. So if you do spend a lot of time driving that car, then I'm sure you're gonna be interested in exactly what this wheel has to offer. So let's start off by going through some of the top level specs and then we'll unpack those in a little bit more detail and of course do some driving tests as well. So in total, we have 38 inputs here. So two rotary encoders on the top including push button functionality. Two more exactly the same in the middle. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six push buttons on either side. Four rotary encoders along the bottom. Those aren't multi-position switches, only rotary encoder functionality there. And then if we spin the wheel around, we have a rocker paddle on the back here, which you can use for ERS deployment, or if you prefer to use it as a shifter, you can do that as well. You've got two digital paddles here for your shifters. Then you've also got two analog paddles at the bottom here. Those can be switched between three different functions. So you've got a dual stage clutch, you've got a analog paddle, which you can assign on either side. So you could use it as a throttle or a brake or a handbrake or something like that. Or you can also assign these as digital switches should you wish to do so as well. Now in terms of outputs, this wheel actually has a lot going on as well. So we've got obviously the five inch LCD screen, which you can see in there. And that is an absolutely beautiful display, amazing contrast ratio. It's a Vocor five inch display with a resolution of 854 pixels by 480 pixels. And as you'll see, the definition that you get there is really great. It's fine enough detail, fine enough resolution that you can actually make out things like leaderboards on the display, which is really nice. And definitely not something that we've seen on some of the more entry level steering wheels that we've reviewed in the past. So definitely wasn't disappointed with the display on this one, even though it is obviously an expensive wheel and you would expect that the display would be absolutely no expense spared as well. And then in terms of other outputs, there's actually a whole lot of other stuff going on here as well. So we've got an array of 10 RGB LEDs across here for your rev strip. These are all individually addressable, so they can all be programmed through SimHub, and we'll look at that later on too. You've got your standard flag LEDs on either side, again, completely configurable. And then all of these buttons and rotary encoders all have RGB LEDs in them as well. But not just that, they actually have four RGB LEDs per switch. And that actually allows you to do a whole bunch of cool stuff that I've personally never seen in a sim racing wheel before. So things like, for example, when you push a button, you can have a color spin. So the color actually changes and spins around the button. Uh, you can have it flash different colors or do different patterns depending on what's going on in the sim as well. They could all flash yellow for a yellow flag, blue for a blue flag. Basically, you name it, you can do it with this wheel. It really does go above and beyond when it comes 
to cool effects and things. So believe it or not, when you add them all up, there's actually 80 individually addressable RGB LEDs in this wheel, which is just crazy, but it does make for some really, really cool uh, and creative things that you can do to make this wheel your own, or just replicate what the wheel looks like in the real life Porsche 911 RSR, if that's the way you wanna go. So while we're still on the subject of buttons, let's have a closer look at exactly what these buttons feel like and operate like compared to some other popular wheels on the market. So this is again, the most expensive wheel that we've ever reviewed here at Boosted Media by almost double. So keep that in mind when we're comparing to the other wheels in just a minute, those do come in at a little bit more than half the price of what this wheel is. So we do have very high expectations here. So let's start with the push buttons. Look, they have a really, really nice uh, feel to them. I, I would say, and I, I don't use this word lightly, but these are almost perfect for me personally and subjectively. And the reason I say that is they've got a good solid click to them. There's a nice clearly defined click there, but they've also got a nice amount of cushion kind of squish there too. So they feel quite purposeful behind them, but they've got a nice positive click as well. And they are nice and consistent as you push them down too. So every single button feels exactly the same as of course you would expect again for a wheel of this kind of price. There's no nasty vibration or reverberation through the aluminum housing either. That's one thing that we have noticed on a couple of cheaper wheels. Again, the buttons sometimes echo a little bit inside the wheel, which can make it feel a little bit more cheap than it may otherwise be. So really, really, really happy with the way these buttons feel in terms of tactile feedback. So then moving on to the rotary encoders and these again are the best that I've ever felt subjectively on any steering wheel that we've tested up until this point here on the channel. And the reason I say that is again, really nice, clearly defined detents in each position, but they've got a nice kind of dampened feeling as well. So if we compare that to say the GSI or Gomez Sim Industries wheel that we reviewed just a little while ago here on the channel, and I'll drop a link to that down in the description below for you. You can see, well, you can hear, it's quite clicky, but it's probably not really gonna come across on camera, but these rotary encoders just felt really flimsy to me. And that was actually one of the things I called out in the review. I felt like they didn't really live up to the quality of the rest of the wheel. The buttons on this I actually really like. Again, they're not quite in the same class as what we have here, but they're very close. But these rotary encoders are just nowhere near as nice as what we have here. You may personally find that you prefer a slightly lighter touch or you might wanna look at something like the Cube Controls CSX3, which actually has a slightly stiffer movement into each position, but it just doesn't quite have that same dampened feel that these rotary encoders have. And look, there isn't a whole lot in it and it's not a reason to go and spend, you know, almost double on a wheel like this compared to this. So I wanna, I wanna make sure that we're putting this in the correct perspective here, but they definitely do feel better than they feel on either one of these two wheels, at least in my opinion. And hopefully the reasons I've given you there as to why I feel that way about them gives you enough information that you can make your own decision on whether that's something that's important to you or not. And remembering again, of course, we do also have the RGB illumination on all these buttons. Now, unlike a lot of other sim racing wheels, these don't have push button functionality, although the thumb encoders do have that functionality. So let's talk about those now. And again, these have a really, really excellent feel. The best thumb encoders that I've felt on any wheel today. And again, it's just that perfect, and I don't use that word perfect light, at all, but um, you know they, they, they have the perfect amount of dampening. They really click into each position nicely, but they're not too stiff with or without gloves. Once again, they just have a really nice feel. And there's a nice little touch there as well. You may notice that they go all the way up to 11. So let's spin the wheel around now and take a look at the paddles and shifters that we have on the back. Then we'll talk a little bit more about ergonomics and functionality with SimHub and all those important things. So on the back of the wheel, we have six paddles in total, two analog paddles, which can also be used in digital mode. Those have 30 mil of travel. Then we have two shifter paddles with about four mil of travel and a rocker paddle with a single pivot point in the middle with also about four millimeters of travel. So interestingly, the analog paddles at the bottom are using Hall Effect sensors, which are completely contactless. So that means there's no moving parts that will potentially wear out and change their calibration over time. Similar to what we see in a lot of other high-end sim racing wheels these days. The other paddles, however, are still using micro switches. So there are moving parts there, which could potentially wear over time. If you compare that to say the cube controls wheels these days, those are using Hall Effect sensors for the, uh, for the digital paddles as well. So look, micro switches aren't necessarily a bad thing. They do have the advantage of keeping things nice and simple. If you're using a Hall Effect sensor, you do need 
need to have an amplifier circuit. That also then needs to be calibrated too. I have had a couple of issues with some other wheels in the past slipping in their calibration and having to go back in and recalibrate later on. So having a micro switch, as long as it's a nice high quality one like what we have on these shifters, shouldn't be a problem. But I do need to obviously just let you guys know because it is a point of difference compared to some of the other high-end wheels that we've looked at recently here on the channel. Now in terms of mechanical adjustability on the analog paddles and the shifter paddles, you can see we've got 10 mil of travel available to slide in and out those five mil thick aluminium paddles. So that gives you plenty of reach adjustment there if you've got shorter or longer fingers. The default setting, which is the minimum, is absolutely fine for me. You can see that's quite nice ergonomically, but again, we'll talk about ergonomics in just a minute. That does also allow you to slightly rotate the paddles up and down should you wish to do so, but I don't see anybody really needing to do that. So if you see on the top here, we've got a couple of little retention screws. If we grab an Allen key, which I prepared earlier, and loosen one of those off, you can see now we're actually able to adjust the angle of that shifter cage. So we're not actually adjusting the throw there, that is fixed at about four mil, but it does give us the ability to move that in and out depending on our reach. So you can see there at the maximum, it's a little bit out of the reach of my finger. I like to kind of have it just inside that knuckle there. So the minimum setting is probably a little shallow, somewhere in the between is pretty good for me. Now I did find out of the box, these on both sides actually did slip on me. So I did actually have to crank them down a little bit tighter than they were by default. But once I did that, it didn't slip on me again. So maybe just a little QA thing there, but um, yeah, I don't think it's gonna be an ongoing issue. It didn't slip again after the first time it did it. But there's no adjustment available on this single pivot rocker switch at the top here. Now, in terms of the construction here as well, you can see full billet aluminum right throughout. Every single component here is all aluminum. You can see the neodymium magnets on the back here as well. These are magnetic paddles. In the case of the single pivot switch, it appears to just be the resistance in the micro switches themselves, which are providing the mechanical resistance there. So there's no magnet or anything like that, but it does have quite a nice feel to it. It is quite intentional, maybe a little bit softer than some people might like. If I compare it to what we have on say the Fnatic McLaren rim, that is quite a lot stiffer in its action, but yeah, you can push pull. You can do what you need to do here. So you know, I don't think that's gonna be an issue for anybody. Mechanical resistance on the shifters is really nice as well. They've got a nice intentional positive click to them. And one thing that you will notice as well, if you really get in there and have a close look is there is a little tiny pre-installed rubber damper on either side of those shifters. So you do have quite a relatively quiet action on these compared to some of the other wheels that we've looked at in the past. If I grab the cube controls wheel by comparison, You can hear just how much louder that is. And we'll grab the Gomez wheel as well. That is also metal to metal contact if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it is. So just quite a lot clunkier and louder. It actually has quite a similar feel to it, but I like what they've done here with the rubber dampers. And same thing again here with the single pivot switch at the top too. There's some little rubber dampers pre-installed. Now some wheels these days come with rubber dampers in the packet and you can install them after the event if you want to, but I like the fact that these are pre-installed. They're nicely done and I don't think we're going to have any issues with them slipping out. So just quickly while we're still around the back here, one other thing to mention with regards to the analog paddles here, these do have three separate modes which you can switch between via a uh, input on the face of the wheel. So you hold down a button and then hold the button on the opposing side and that allows you to switch between the three different modes and that is all very clearly outlined in the manual. And it's nice that you don't have to alt tab out of your game to make that adjustment too. Everything can be done right there on the wheel. So you've got a standard digital input mode which just works like a switch so it's either on or off. There's no in between. You could set it to be two individually mappable axes as well. So maybe if you wanted to have it set to be your look left and right, maybe your throttle and brake or a handbrake, something like that, you can do that too. And you can map that to be any analog function that you want inside the SIM provided that your SIM takes the input. And we didn't have any issues with mapping at all in any of the SIMs that we tried this wheel on. Uh, and then you also have your standard bite point clutch as well. So that works pretty much the same as it does on any other wheel. So you pull both paddles in, it takes it to 100% clutch input. Then you drop one side, it takes you down to your threshold point that gets the car underway without any wheel spin and then you slowly release your second hand to get the car completely underway now the way that you calibrate that bite point on this wheel is quite clever as well so there's a button sequence that you press and we'll show you that on the screen right now to put it into calibration mode and then what you can do is use the two buttons on the front as a coarse and fine adjustment and you'll see the rpm strip along the top lights up so each individual red segment is 10 percent adjustment so you can imagine if you have a uh, if you have seven led 
LEDs lit up, that would take you to 70%. And then if you use the fine adjustment, you get green LEDs and that is from zero to 10% within that range. So if you were to go say seven red LEDs and five green LEDs, that would be your clutch threshold point set at 75%. So quite clever. It is a little bit hard to get your head around at first the first few times you do it, but I do much prefer this method rather than having, again, to alt tab out of the game to go and set something up in a separate piece of software and then come back in again. It means that if you're quickly switching between cars, you're about to start a race and you realize that you forgot to set your threshold point, you can quickly do it while you're sitting on the grid without too much drama. So I really like the fact that they thought about things that can actually be achieved on the wheel itself without having to rely on software to make those adjustments. So let's take a look now at what they include inside the box. Now you might've seen some of the earlier shots in the video. We didn't have any stickers installed on these buttons. So what we've done here is put the stickers on which match the real life race car, but they do include a high quality sticker sheet here with a vast array of different buttons. Now I did it this way simply because I wanted it to be like for like for the review video. Nobody really is gonna need a drink button, I don't think. So, uh, you know, things like that, you can definitely change to suit your preference. And I may end up pulling some of these off and swapping them out for some of the more sim-friendly buttons that we have on the sticker sheet, but really nice high quality stickers here. And as you can see in the footage, the illuminated buttons shine through these stickers really nicely in the areas that they're meant to without too much bleed in the areas that they aren't. That was one complaint that we had about the CSX three wheel from Cube Controls is the stickers aren't anywhere near the quality that we have here. And there is quite a lot of bleed through them. They just kind of, uh, they kind of wash out when you have the brightness turned up quite high. And I've had a few other people complain to me about that with the Cube Controls wheels as well. So this is definitely a step up in quality with the stick sheet. Again, as you would expect for the price. Just with regards to the stickers though, one thing that I didn't include in the box, which I would have liked to see and that you do get with Cube Controls is a little pair of plastic tweezers to just make it a little bit easier to put the stickers on without getting grubby fingerprints all over them and reducing the adhesiveness. Uh, that I actually went and got the, got the plastic tweezers out of the Cube Controls box to put the stickers on this, as you can see in the footage here. Now, otherwise inside the box, there are some pretty cool things that they've done here. So you get the standard mounting hardware to mount your wheel to the quick release of your choice. You get a couple of T-nuts and mounting bolts too, which we'll talk about in just a second. You get this really nice high quality coiled cable to go from your wheel, and that is a keyed connection, as you can see there. So one end connects through to your wheel. Now the other end connects through to this nice little tiny anodized aluminum interface box. And you can see that has got a USB-B connection on one end, which goes into your two meter long USB A to B cable, which they include in the box. Now you may notice there, there is also a DC jack. Now I'm really, really, really happy about this. They also include inside the box an external power supply. Now you might be thinking that's a little bit clunky, a little bit cumbersome, and you'd rather just plug it straight in. So an issue that we've run into in the past with a number of wheels is if you overload the USB interface on your motherboard, or even if you've got a powered hub and you have too many devices plugged into it, you can run into all sorts of issues with reliability, particularly when it comes to these Vocor screens that they're using in these. They seem to be particularly susceptible to power related issues. Things like voltage droop can make them go crazy, make them go all garbled on the screen or just drop out completely. No, the steering wheel messed up. <laughs> I've been having issues with the USB hub for a couple of days. It just glitched out, but my shifters are back now. So having an external power supply does away with those issues. Happy to report I haven't had a single issue with regards to reliability on the screen. So for those who might be wondering, that power supply is a 12 volt DC output with a three amp power rating or 36 watts. So you can imagine, you know, three amps of power is quite a lot to be drawing through a, uh, through a powered USB hub or something like that. So it obviously makes sense that they do that. One thing we did actually notice about this wheel when I was using it at maximum brightness is it does actually generate quite a bit of warmth through the body. It actually feels quite warm to touch anywhere other than the rubber grip. So again, not a problem, but something that we observed and definitely would be a reason why they would be using an external power supply. So yeah, you get this little interface box here. It's got the keyed, connection on one side for the link cable between the wheel and the interface box. Some little metal tabs here 
for connecting via the T-nuts that we showed you just a moment ago. So you can mount those on the rig anywhere that you want. Obviously, if you don't have a T-slot rig, then you can come up with some other solution. I actually just stuck this to the rig with a little bit of double-sided tape so that I could take it back off easily for the review. And you can see on the front here, a little inlay of carbon fiber. So very nicely finished. And on the front, we've got the grid logo. Warning, 12 volts. <laughs> Shouldn't be too dangerous. And use approved grid wheels only. And just with regards to the connection cable as well, one other thing that I did want to point out is if you have a look around on the back of the wheel here, you can see it is a nice high quality connection. One of the things that they've told me is that they've intentionally designed this. You can see the little carbon fiber inlay here. If that plug does become damaged for any reason, all you need to do is just unscrew the two little pieces here and then that entire module is relatively easily replaceable. So let's talk a little bit more now about the ergonomics and driving experience with this wheel. Now, the first thing you're gonna notice when you pick one of these up is that it is extremely heavy. It weighs in at 2,050 grams or 2.05 kilograms. Now, in my experience, experimenting with this wheel on a couple of different bases, the uh, the threshold where I felt that it started to have a, uh, a noticeable impact on the quality of the force feedback was around about the sort of 10 Newton meter mark. So if you're running on a more entry level direct drive wheelbase, this may not be the wheel for you. Anything over about 10 Newton meters for me at least felt fine. Now, when I say the impact, what I mean by that is the dampening effect that it has on the force feedback. Anything that you add weight wise to the stem of your motor is adding rotating mass to that wheel. So what that means is you're gonna have a little bit more inertia with rotation, which can actually feel quite nice in your hands if you've got a more powerful base, but it will also impact the response time of the wheel as well. So if it's having to you know, change direction very quickly with this kind of weight attached to it, if you don't have a very powerful motor, you will notice the impact of that. But again, on the flip side, it does give you the, the sensation of the wheel actually being mechanically connected to something in the car as well. So if you're driving with a wheelbase that doesn't have a lot of sort of natural inertia, natural friction, then you may actually find that you like the feeling of a heavier wheel attached to your wheelbase. But I would imagine, you know, again, in the context of this wheel and given its price point, I would imagine most people are going to be running a more high-end direct drive wheelbase anyway. But if you are running something like a uh, like a CSL DD or maybe like a Mozza R9 or R5, then this probably isn't going to be a good wheel for that base just based on the weight of it alone. Now, otherwise, ergonomically, we've got a diameter of 300 millimeters, which is pretty much ideal for a variety of different styles of cars. Now, again, this wheel is obviously very specific in its target audience and type of car that they're gonna be driving. But if you wanna drive Formula style cars or even GT style cars, you aren't gonna have any trouble at 300 millimeter. The other thing I really like about it as well is that all the controls are very, very easily reachable. So I can rotate my thumb around and I don't have the biggest hands in the world. I've actually got pretty girly hands. And uh, as I rotate my thumb around, I can reach all of those buttons on the side quite comfortably. The only ones that I actually have to take my hands off the wheel or my eyes off the road to navigate to adjust the rotary encoders on the front of the thumb wheels all work very nicely with or without gloves. And as I mentioned earlier, the amount of resistance in those rotary encoders is, the word that I would use is perfect for me at least. I really, really like the way that these feel. Now the grips themselves are nicely designed as well. A lot thinner than what we have with the, again, I'll use the Gomez wheel as a point of reference because this is something that was a polarizer for a lot of people. You can see just how thick the rubber grips are on this wheel. Now I actually quite liked that. I felt it, it felt quite chunky and nice in my hands, quite significant. But for a lot of people, that was actually a deal breaker with this wheel. And I actually spoke to quite a few people that bought these wheels and ended up selling them purely because they didn't like the feeling of the grip and just how chunky they were. And since the time that we reviewed this wheel, which wasn't all that long ago, Gomez have actually released another new model now, which has grips that are more similar to this sort of style. So you can see they're a lot thinner, but they still feel very comfortable in your hands. Pretty much exactly the same rubberized material that we see used on the Gomez wheel as well. So it does feel nice and squishy in your hands. It does have a tendency to feel a little bit tacky and it does also have a tendency to pick up dirt and debris and dead skin cells from your hands as well. So look, it does have the advantage when you compare it to say leather or Alcantara of being extremely durable. We haven't had any issues with any of the wheels that we've seen with this material used. And we have had quite a few of them that we've used for a number of years now. Never seen any issues with it wearing down. However, I will say that if we compare it with the CSX3 from Cube Controls, they've actually used a different type of material on this wheel, which looks very similar and has a similar amount of squish to it, but it doesn't have that same kind of tacky, sticky feel to it. It's a lot smoother and it's actually a lot easier to clean and uh, it doesn't pick up anywhere near as much dirt and debris and skin cells and things like that. So I would say I actually do prefer the material that they've used on the Cube Controls wheel. The other thing that I really liked about this design as well is they've been sensible 
and actually put hard plastic in the highest areas of wear on this wheel too. And if you wanna see more detail on that, definitely check out the review video that we did on the CSX3 just recently here on the channel. But look, there's definitely nothing wrong with the grips on this wheel. It's purely gonna be a uh, personal preference style thing. I just personally struggle a little bit with the tacky feel of the rub grips with bare hands. Obviously with gloves, it's not an issue at all. But otherwise, very, very comfortable to use. Everything is very well laid out, of course, as you would expect, being a replica of the real life race car wheel. And look, ergonomically, there's really nothing else to really speak about there. So let's move on now to the materials used. We've already talked about a few of them with relation to the inputs and the shifters and stuff. But there's a few other bits and pieces that we need to cover here as well. So the entire face plate of the wheel here is constructed of one single piece of five millimeter thick genuine carbon fiber. So you can kind of see the outline of the carbon fiber around the tempered glass screen protector, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But we have a black sticker here over the fascia of the wheel, which actually covers a lot of that carbon fiber. Some people might actually prefer that that sticker wasn't even there so they could see the carbon fiber underneath. But again, being a replica, it is the way it is. But you can see it gives you that nice kind of edge around the wheel. And that being one single piece of carbon fiber does also make the wheel very rigid as well. So there's absolutely no twist in there whatsoever. Obviously it's hard to see moving around on camera. So there is absolutely no plastic on any of the touch points on this wheel whatsoever. The bezels around the switches are all anodized aluminum. The knobs on the rotary encoders and of course the thumb encoders as well, all anodized aluminum too. And even if we flip the wheel around, as we saw before, everything here is all anodized aluminum. The housing, everything, which obviously contributes to the weight as well, but it does make it very, very solid and nicely constructed. In fact, the only plastic that I see anywhere is literally just the little micro switches for the shifter paddles and uh, inside the single pivot rocker switch there. Literally every other piece of the wheel is either metal or carbon fiber. And it's important to point out as well that that is actually a genuine Porsche emblem that's on there too. It's not some cheap replica or piece of plastic or something. That is a beautiful metal badge, just like you would find on the real car. So it really does give it that really classy look to it. And it's really something that you'll appreciate every single time you sit down in front of this wheel. Now I briefly touched on the tempered glass fascia just before as well. This is really nicely finished, exactly the same kind of design that we saw on the Grid by SimLab Porsche dash that we reviewed just a little while on the channel as well. So you can check that out via the links down in the description below too if you're interested. So you've got the LEDs really nicely integrated here with a flush panel across the front. Those don't have any sort of bleed or anything like that across in between individual LEDs. So you get a really nice contrast ratio between the black areas and the LED areas there. The Porsche logo is really nicely integrated too, and it all appears to just be one piece of glass there. Being tempered glass, it is relatively scratch resistant as well. It isn't a touch screen. And again, if we pull across the Gomez wheel and the Cube Controls wheel for reference, once again, one of the things I didn't like about the Cube Controls wheels was this plastic bezel around it. Just kind of looks ugly. And one of the big complaints that I had was that it actually blocks a few pixels on the top and bottom of the screen, depending on your viewing angle. And even if you look square onto the screen, and you can check the review on this for all the details on this, but yeah, it was just blocking a couple of pixels, not an issue at all on the Porsche wheel. Every single pixel on the display is visible within reasonable viewing angles, at least. Remembering, of course, it's a steering wheel, it's gonna be in front of you, so you're not gonna be looking at it completely side on, but yeah, in front of it, it looks absolutely fine. And yeah, I mean, again, it's a subjective thing, but I actually really like this clean, integrated look compared to something that's kind of extreme extruded like what we have with the GSI wheel as well. Although I do like the fact that this is metal on this wheel and not plastic like what we had on the Cube Controls wheel. Now I know we usually have a little bit of a sneaky look inside the wheels that review here at Boosted Media. Unfortunately, you can't really pull this wheel apart to have a look inside yourself. You can see up the top here, these blister stickers, as well as the sticker down the bottom are actually covering the screw holes. And if I try to peel those stickers off, I really don't want to destroy them. So I'm not going to pull this wheel apart. However, I was able to get a couple of photos from Grid by SimLab to show you the internals. Looks pretty much exactly the same kind of build quality as what we saw with the dash which doesn't surprise me at all. So if you wanna have a look at the kind of quality that you can expect from this wheel, in addition to what you're seeing on your screen right now in these still photos, then you can definitely check out that dash review. And that gives you a little bit more of a picture of what's going on inside. But just lastly on the hardware, before we move on into our conclusions, just need to talk a little bit about this hub adapter, which is integrated as well. So this is a standard run of the mill 70 millimeter stud pattern like you would find on the majority of wheels. What they've done here is every second hole has a thread and the holes next to them don't have threads. So that basically means that if you've got a quick release that you need to bolt in from the back, you can go through the hole in the quick release to the thread 
on the hub adapter, or if you've got a quick release that has threads on it, you can go through the front, through the holes without threads, and that way you don't get any thread binding going on. Now, one little point of complaint here is, uh, and we were using the Zero Play quick release, which is actually a product that is developed by uh, hybrid racing simulations here in Australia, but uh, Simlab actually sell these as one of the items that they stock as well. These are the This is the quick release that we've been using here on the channel for a number of years now. We have a review on this link down in the description below for you guys as well. So this bolts on in a standard fashion like so. And uh, the ones that I ordered actually do have threads on them. What I've done in a couple of cases is just drill those threads out with a five mil drill bit uh, to be able to bolt in from the other direction. But in this case, I wanted to be able to bolt through from the front and the screws that they include, or the little bolts that they include uh, inside the box for the wheel are a little bit too tall to fit through comfortably from the front side, which was a little bit frustrating. But more importantly, they don't include an Allen key in the box. So if you're trying to use a standard kind of Allen key like you'd find in any hardware store, you can't actually get it in there. You can see it's not gonna reach with the screw in there as well, and particularly when you get around the shifters, which makes it impossible to do up. Now, if you compare it with Cube Controls, what they do is they actually include inside the little hardware tool bag a very, very shallow little Torx kit actually include Torx up bolts in the case of cube controls, but in this case it's hex. But it would definitely be nice if they included a shallow little Allen key just to make that that little bit easier. Little things like that are really frustrating when you've just spent a lot of money on an expensive piece of gear, you're really excited to get it up on your rig and then you can't install it because of something stupid like that. So not a major issue. And again, depending on the quick release that you're planning on mounting this to, it may not be a problem for you at all. But you know, when you're paying this kind of money for something, these are the kinds of little things that we do have to nitpick. But in terms of the quality of the hub itself, absolutely no complaints whatsoever. However, there was no discernible flex from side to side with the wheel mounted on the wheelbase or anything like that. So absolutely fine in that regard. So let's talk a little bit now about the software side of things. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the core functionality with this wheel is adjustable and changeable directly from the wheel itself, which means you don't need to go into an app to make adjustments. Now, they are actually developing an app similar to what we have with Cube Controls uh, to make adjustments to things like the lights. At the moment, all of the lights are completely configurable from within SimHub. It can be a little bit clunky, however, to get things working. We did run into a few issues just sort of trying to customize things ourselves to really get the most out of this so it is a little bit of a labor of love when it comes to things like this and anybody that's used sim hub for more advanced functionality like that would know exactly what i'm talking about there uh, we had similar kinds of issues when we tested the gomez wheel as well so it's certainly not a complaint about this wheel specifically it took me three or four days to actually get that wheel up and running with quite a few of the functions so yeah it's just one of those things sim hub is such a powerful piece of software there's so many things it can do and with that level of functionality also of course comes a level of complexity so it does take a little bit of time to get your head around it but the good news there is that Grid do have a very strong online community on Discord. There's a lot of user created profiles that are shared there as well as some official ones too. And those profiles are more than enough to get you up and running with the basics and you can customize on top of that should you wish to do so. And that's something that I was really happy to see. You may remember we reviewed a Grid Dash a number of years ago now. And one of the complaints that I had about that at the time was that there wasn't enough community support behind it. There wasn't really enough profiles and things like that to really sort of, I guess, justify the cost of that product at the time. So I'm really happy to see that that is something that they've really been working on and they've really strengthened in the number of years that it's been since we did that review. So you can expect good community support there. Uh, yeah, we did have a couple of little teething issues with setting this up. They were really quick to help us, but again, you know, we're reviewers, so it's not necessarily typical of the uh, standard customer experience. But yeah, if you jump on Discord, there'll be somebody there that will help you out and those default profiles work really nicely. So SimHub is relatively easy to get up and running. You simply open up the software. Uh, they do have in the latest versions a profile thing there built in too. So what you can do is you can actually tell SimHub that this is the device that you've got connected and it kind of sets you up with some default profiles ready to go. If you want to do more complex stuff, you may want to set the screen and the LEDs up separately as you see here. But as is the case with any SimHub compatible wheel, the sky is really the limit when it comes to what you can do there with creativity and adjusting LEDs, making them do all kinds of funky things. And as you saw earlier with the four individually addressable LEDs that we have for each of the individual buttons on this wheel, you can do all kinds of funky effects like spinning and uh, you know reacting to inputs and things like that too. So really at the end of the day, it's as complex as you wanna make it, but I am looking forward to seeing what they bring to the table with their own software package to make things that little bit easier just to configure colors and things like that.
So I've been using this wheel for a couple of weeks now. I'll show you some driving footage from that time while we talk about the pros and cons, starting off with the pros. So first thing I really liked about this wheel, obviously other than its physical appearance and just the striking appearance that this wheel has being a replica, you know, the real life Porsche Lego, all those things that are very subjective. Uh, objectively, really good documentation, good diagrams, uh, great community support as well through the Discord community. That's, as we mentioned earlier, something that they've really been working hard on. So it was really great to see that. I really like the SIM hub integration as well. Obviously it does come with its complexities, but it means that you can do all sorts of really complex and crazy things with this wheel if you wish to do so. Really like what they've done with the four LEDs per switch as well that allows you that extra level of creativity. Great contrast ratio on the screen, really nice and clear and vibrant, nice and easy to be able to read text as well. Leaderboards and things like that aren't gonna be an issue at all using this wheel, which is a really big step up from some of those older USB D480 based wheels and dashes that we've seen in the past where you just really couldn't make out that really fine text in some cases. The build quality on this wheel is, I would say, the best I've seen. Now, it is quite close to, say, something like an Asher Racing wheel or a Gomez Sim Industries wheel. Uh, the main difference between this and the Gomez wheel just being the quality of the rotary encoders. Uh, I much prefer them on this wheel to what I did on the uh, on the Gomez wheel. But otherwise, look, it is, it is relatively similar in terms of overall build quality, which of course does beg the question, why is it so much more expensive than something like that? And we'll get onto that into our conclusions a little bit later on. But yeah, build quality is absolutely fantastic with this wheel. You're definitely not gonna have any any issues there if you buy one of these. It definitely does match what you would expect for a product of this caliber. As I touched on just before, rotary encoders all feel really, really nice. The buttons feel really nice. And I don't use the word lightly, but honestly, these are absolutely perfect for me and what I subjectively like in terms of button feel. The amount of squish, the amount of uh, you know resistance, all those things, just they've really, really nailed it, at least for what I like in my buttons and rotary encoders, thumb encoders and whatnot. Layout is really great as well. Ergonomically, the wheel is absolutely spot spot on, no issues with reach or anything like that. Everything works really nicely in that regard as well. Plenty of adjustment available. That goes for your inputs as well as mechanical adjustments to things like the shifters. You can move the paddles in and out, adjust the uh, angles, adjust the uh, different modes for the analog paddles and whatnot. You can scroll back in the video to see exactly how all of that works. And lastly, I really like what they've done with the interface box too with that external power supply. That really does do away with a lot of potential issues that you might have depending on your hardware configuration. And I think it's a really smart choice on their part. So cons wise, it is a very niche product being Porsche branded. Would love to see them adopt the same kind of quality in a more generic wheel with wider appeal. Obviously you're not gonna be wanting to stare at a Porsche badge if you're driving a Ferrari or a Lambo or something like that. So it does definitely narrow down the target audience for a wheel like this. It is extremely expensive as well. You do get what you pay for, but it certainly isn't gonna be a wheel for everybody. And we'll unpack that a little bit more in our conclusions in just a second. One complaint that I do have, which we haven't mentioned prior is the the little interface box, I really wish that this had a power button on it. Now, a lot of rigs, people are turning off at the wall when they finish driving for the day, but if you do have a rig that stays powered on for some reason, being an external power supply here, the wheel is gonna stay powered up all the time unless you go and unplug it or switch it off at the wall. Now, they do tell me they are working on something for that. I assume it's gonna be a power button on the interface module. It may be something on the wheel. I'm not sure at this point, but this seems like the sensible place to put it, at least to me. So yeah, that was one thing that I immediately kind of thought, where's the power button? and it turned out there wasn't one. So that's one thing that I do hope that they improve. There were a couple of other little bits and pieces as well. We mentioned the Allen key as well. Really wish that they included a nice shallow Allen key to make it a little bit easier to mount through to the front onto your quick release. Again, depending on the quick release that you're using, it may or may not be an issue for you. Easily solvable by just using a different type of bolt or whatever. But again, for the price, I would like them to include those little things. Tweezers as well for applying the stickers would be a nice touch. Uh, no pulse width adjustment for the rotary encoders. That is something that we've seen on uh, quite a lot of other wheels these days. Uh, that allows you to just adjust how sensitive these are to movements. Now, admittedly, with the uh, with the quality of these rotary encoders and the way that they snap into position, you probably aren't gonna find you need them, but if you are the sort of person that kind of you know flicks the thing like that to move up or flicks it to move down, rather than doing individual clicks, that pulse width adjustment can be quite useful. So that may be something that they can add in their software package, which is coming a little bit later on, or so they tell us. So uh, yeah, we'll definitely uh, keep Keep our eyes peeled for that one. But if you do own one of these, well, let us know. Have you run into any issues with that? Is it something that you would like to see or is it a non-issue for you? 
While we're on the subject of rotary encoders, a lot of other wheels that are a lot cheaper than this do have multi-position switch modes available. These do only operate as rotary encoders. The disadvantage of that is that the SIM isn't gonna know what mechanical position the switch is in. So a lot of SIM software doesn't actually recognize multi-position switches, so a lot of wheels allow you to choose between different modes. But yeah, these are only rotary encoders. They don't have any push button functionality on the fore, on the face, although the thumb encoders do have that push button functionality. So yeah, maybe a V2 version of this wheel we might see multi-position switches. And then lastly, and I wasn't sure whether to put this on the pros or the cons list, to be honest with you. Initially, I kind of thought of it as a bit of a con, and then I kind of came around towards the end of the review and kind of thought of it as a pro. But I put calibration and adjustment is a little bit clunky at first, but fine once you get your head around it. And you saw earlier how we can change different modes for the analog paddles or adjust our bite point using the dials on the front of the wheel. Now, the reason I kind of thought of it as a con at first is it's a little bit clunky. It's a little bit tricky to get your head around and I kind of felt, oh, it'd be nice if you could just go into the software and just adjust it. But then when I thought about it and got used to it, I was like, well, you know, it, it's, it's also equally as nice, if not nicer, to not have to alt tab out of your game to make those adjustments. So it is what it is. You guys can decide whether that's a pro or a con but that's the way it works. So in conclusion, this is the nicest sim racing wheel that I've ever tested to date, but it's also twice the price of something like the Gomez wheel or the uh, Cube Controls CSX3. So obviously you do have very, very high expectations when it comes to a wheel like this. And I certainly wouldn't say that it is twice as good as one of those wheels. So whether or not the price is justified is really up to you. Now, being such a niche product as well, I think the majority of the people that are gonna buy this probably knew that they wanted it the moment that they saw it. They're probably not gonna be swayed by a, you know, a review like this one that's kind of going through the pros and cons and how the you know, mechanical things actually work. It's something that you look at and you either want it or you don't want it. And I kind of consider it to be more like a collector's item or a showpiece, something like a piece of jewelry or a nice watch, rather than something that I would suggest that every single sim racer aspires to own. So of course, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Some people just like to have nice things. And I think if you've got the money, then you're absolutely gonna be satisfied with this. But look, on the objective side, they really nailed the details on this wheel. I think that's, you know, from the form factor, the way the buttons feel, the ergonomics, the details, like using the dedicated power supply, all those things that we've touched on in today's review are all really nice touches. The wheel is definitely amongst the most comfortable that I've used as well. They've obviously put a lot of effort into the finer details with this wheel and it really does show. So in final conclusion, I'm glad that showpiece products like this do exist. And I'm glad that there are people out there that can afford things like this. It certainly isn't gonna be for everybody, but you know, technology that we see and you know, innovation that we see in products like this does end up filtering ultimately down into more affordable products as well. I can't help but feel that I would like to see a more generic version of this, maybe something that was unlicensed that had similar kind of build quality, similar kind of functionality at a lower price point. If they can get it down to the price of something like the GSI wheel or the uh, or the Cube Control CSX3 wheel, I think that they would sell a lot more of them. They tell me that they've already sold hundreds of these though. So obviously they're doing something right. And if you do happen to own one of these wheels, definitely let us know what your experience has been like down in the comments below. But yeah, it's an absolutely awesome wheel. I just can't help but feel that it is very, very, very expensive for what it brings to the table, particularly when you compare it to what else is available out there as well. But again, as I said before, this is more of a showpiece. It's more of a piece of art than a piece of functional equipment. Although it does have all that functionality, but I don't think people are buying it purely for its functionality. They're buying it because it looks awesome and it's something that they, uh, you know, they're gonna be proud to own. And I definitely think that, uh, you know, when you consider all those things, the target market for a, uh, for a product like this, I honestly don't see any reason to say anything other than I think that they've really nailed it. So uh, yeah, I hope that today's video has helped you out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel as well if you haven't already. And if you do decide you wanna pick one of these up or any of the other products that you've seen mentioned in today's video, check out the links down in the description below. That is an awesome way of helping to support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you. And we really do appreciate all the support there. But above all, thank you very much for watching guys. And we will see you again very soon. Let us know what you think of this new review style in the new studio as well. We'd really love to see your feedback there too. See you again soon. Bye.